Day three of the June 99 seven day retreat in spring water. What an amazing change in weather. From very hot and muggy. And then these sheets of rain. And now a cool morning. Clear and sparkling. Clouded over right now. When I was little, particularly when we were on vacation in the mountains, and there was a beautiful, sunny, cloudless day, I thought to myself, this will never change. How could it? There's no cloud in the sky. Where would it come from? And it's only very recently with these amazing satellite weather pictures that it has really sunk in, that weather doesn't depend on where I happen to be. <laughs> it depends on everywhere else. can learn so much from weather. But I've gone into it before, I don't want to bore you. Things that people have brought up. Saying, don't we all come here with expectations? Is, is there a single retreatant? who doesn't come with expectations, wanting something, wanting to get back something, that wonderful, peaceful way of being, or wanting to get it, one hasn't had it yet, one has read and heard about it, wanting to deepen one's practice, strengthen one's sitting, or have a vacation. What's wrong with it, this person asked. What's wrong with coming here with expectations? We all come with that. Well, why should there be anything wrong with it? Can we begin to loosen the grip of this way of thinking? And giving way to realizing this is how I come here with expectations. The, the more this is allowed to show itself without immediately being branded wrong, the more it becomes transparent what it is we want and don't want and hope for and fear. And also a dawning realization that in sitting down, finally we're here after whatever all the preparations it took, Just to constantly think of what I'm expecting gets in the way. Do we realize that at times? That plain sitting needs no expectation. And as it arises, it is just seen as one of the movements of body-mind. Beheld in the sitting It's a marvelous shift when it takes place from wanting and expecting to hearing, realizing, experiencing the buzz of wanting and expecting in a spacious beholding. That 
neither wants to do away with the buzz nor accept the buzz. It's just there at this moment. And maybe in this beholding dissipating. Maybe. Not to expect it. An expectation one also realizes is a real setup for disappointment. Or if we get what we expected, the next minute we want more of it. To, to learn about all of these movements of the mind and body that motivate human beings like you and me to become intimate, aware of it in a space that does not reject or accept. It sounds like a tall order, doesn't it? In this vein, What comes up in, in every retreat, particularly in the beginning days, but very often particularly in the ending days, in other words, who knows when, I still have all these thoughts. How is it possible after so many years of sitting there still all these thoughts, fantasies, desires? One person saying, it used to be in my practice that I made two steps forward, but then one step backward, and another few steps forward, and some backward. But recently, it's all backward. And I come here to have some forward. <laughs> it's the wrong place. <laughs> oh, people saying, how is it possible that people who work in a spiritual center can be so tense with each other, mean to each other, aggressive toward each other. You'd think that people who are working in a spiritual center with all this sitting would be beyond all of this. How is it possible one can ask summarily that we are as we are? How is that possible? You're not laughing. I think it's a very funny question. <laughs> How can it be that with hours, days, years, decades of training, I get angry or upset? Or others do. And with these thoughts come depressive moods or discouraged moods, angry moods, upset of what one has established for oneself as the way things ought to be. People ought to be and I, I myself ought to be. And the constant stumbling over that. Stumbling is a mild word. Getting into real trouble with it. Sorrow, pain, negativity. Because things and people and situations aren't the way that they ought to be the way I have established it or thought has established it in the mind. This incredible fantasy of which the brain is all too capable of. to see how things ought to be and feel the discrepancy, the painful discrepancy between how things are and people are and how I am and the way they ought to be according to my fantasy which is nourished by reading and remembering and thinking and listening to talks and speeches and lectures.
one person in, in, in a meeting said something like, well, is that the answer to accept it all? And we have these ready phrases for accepting. Well, that's just the way things are, or that's just the way we are, or that's the way people are, or human beings are. But that's preventing inquiry or looking deeper. And by looking deeper, I don't mean looking for causes. A deeper meaning, what we said yesterday, this muddy puddle, and no one's stirring in it to try to make order in it. Allowing it to be there on the hillside, under the sun and clouds with the winds. and see what happens with attention given to it, listening, looking, that doesn't meddle and muddle any further. It's just there, present. If judgments come up, can they be seen? And the seeing is a zapper. Seeing that judgments get in the way, they muddle up again. So, to, to go deeper with this phrase, just see people the way they are. See yourself the way you are. See the situation the way it is, how do we see? And I don't mean what by what method, but at what depth? Or at what transparency? Not just here, but here and there. To begin to see what moves us. to react, to react aggressively or passive-aggressively, selfishly, our attachment to possession, to our position, to being something, to not being regarded, to being hurt, to being disregarded or slighted, to see that transparently in ourselves and others. It's all on display there for the looking, there for the discovering. Not just I accept you the way you are, but I really see and understand because it's transparent here what moves me to react or to repress, to be afraid or aggressive. Takes great subtlety of awareness because we are so used to ourselves and so convinced that we are right, a little bit more right than the others. Yes, it has a strong hold, like a tight vice. Is that the right word? Vice? Vice? Vice. The thing that holds a piece of wood so it doesn't rattle when you saw it. But it can become transparent. That's the amazing miracle of human living, becoming transparent to oneself and to each other. And then our responses change. in an unfathomable way. So, in sitting, being with each other, are we full of ourselves? It's not said gently, it's said 
experientially, factually, full of ourselves, our rights, our wrongs, our needs, our plans, our possessions, our capacities, just chock full of ourselves, then there is no room for transparency, as only mine will be done. And you're wrong if you deny it to me, because I have a right to it. For instance, you, you fill it in. It's, it's, it's for all of us to, to see and discover. It's there. But wonder of wonders, we're not always chock full of ourselves. Maybe not completely empty, that's another ideal, that we come here with the expectation of finding emptiness of self. But not completely filled up with our own concerns, our own importance. See, look at me, how, how good I am, how important, how, how clever I am. This kind of stuff comes into view very often in a retreat like this, where one doesn't get very much feedback from others. One is used to a lot of feedback to nourish the sense of me, my importance, my significance, my whatever all. And here, something is lacking. People don't look at me and admire me as much as I'm used to or would like to have. So then maybe it becomes a mirroring of this meanness filling up the space. And in the mirroring there is more room to hear the wind in the trees, the birds, and to see other people in a new way, not just in relationship to me, 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 So then, in sitting down and so many thoughts, and then more thoughts about having so many thoughts. I shouldn't have them. I wish I didn't have them. There were times when I was almost without thought. And beholding it, spaciously, not what I should be like. Whose are these thoughts anyways? Who's the owner? of the thoughts, the body, the looks, the capacities. Who's the owner? Find the owner and bring it here. <laughs> that sounds pretty old fashioned. <laughs> It's not that one develops more tolerance toward oneself or more, more compassion, of course, one may put it into those words and those are highly inspiring words. I have more compassion for myself. But if one looks beyond the word, does it mean that there's more room to look without an immediate identification. These are my thoughts and I shouldn't have them, or these are good thoughts and let nobody take them away from me. To, to see what's going on without this compulsive sense of identification. This is me, this is mine. Is that possible? Well, what is, what is possible and necessary is to illuminate thoroughly the movement of identification and what goes with it. 
the potential pleasure and the potential or actual pain. Potential loss at any time of what I thought was me and mine. And if there isn't this strong hold of identification, then there is less pain and easier letting go. Because one has learned about the process of identifying thoroughly in one's own experience with all its pains and agonies and maybe sleepless nights. Lost of friends, feeling isolated or abandoned. As we sit or move, work with what comes up in ourselves and others, how quickly can we catch the condemnation, the rejection, the criticism, the judgment, or identification? And pause, pause for a moment. As coming upon it, pause. What's going on? What's happening? And see if the, the train, the conditioned program train of going on with rejection or condemnation or identification and holding on, whether that heavy train can give way to attention, of its, first of all, of its power to want to drag us with it. We may find we don't want to stop. We want to be in our old tracks of judging ourselves, judging others, raising up our hands and rolling our eyes in despair. It's a way of living. And we're attached to every bit of way of living, even though we may complain about it. To, to, to find, to come upon this attachment to our living in, in a train of complaint. Not, not really wanting to let go of it, and yet complaining about always complaining it, to watch it, and to hold it, and listen to the traffic, and this gentle breeze in the grasses and trees. People ask, particularly if one hasn't been here before, what about discipline? I'm used to sitting in a bliss disciplined structure. And people have observed over the years that it is much harder to sit without a disciplined structure and with one, even though that brings a lot of pain, but it also has an encouragement by the members, the teachers. And as one person said, one can measure oneself against pro uh, progress. How am I doing now? How many rounds have I sat? How, how much pain have I endured? So, is there a place for discipline? 
This is not a new question, but it is raised every once in a while freshly. Of course, in, in this place, there is no imposed discipline, except we have certain fundamental rules. Not talking, sort of going with the flow, reading in certain areas and not in others. There are certain things that have evolved out of our retreating together. It's not somebody dreamt this up and thinks this is good for you, but uh, people have sort of agree that this is a helpful way of retreating in quietness. But other than these fundamental rules, that's not even rules, guidelines, to, to, to go easy on the words too, because words have such a power. We don't impose any discipline from the outside. Of course, one realizes as one sits here how much there is in here programmed in the past, maybe predating any conditioning in, in a spiritual training center. One person told me, this is so, as old as I am, to be good, to be right, to work hard, to do better, and to really feel the tremendous tension of that. What a straitjacket it is, and one seems to be not able to get rid of it, this inner voice. At a certain point, at a certain level, this, this voice does not penetrate to the depth, just like the waves and bubbles on the ocean don't penetrate to the depth, where it's quiet, dark, very little or no motion. So then somebody reminded me in one of those meetings where this discipline thing came up that she just read something what Krishnamurti said about discipline. I forget now what aspect she had remembered, what I remember. And he always pointed out that this word means learning. It's a faculty of learning. Discipline of mathematics, discipline of biology or medicine. That's how it used to be called old-fashionedly. And the disciple is one who is learning. And maybe, in those ancient days, maybe when this word formed itself, also highly interested in what he's learning, with a passion for it. And if there is in us a, an ember of passion to learn more about ourselves, how we react, how we respond in turmoil and in quietness, then there is a discipline emerging, meaning some energy, some attention to watch, to be here, because we're interested. We want to find out. We've suffered enough. Don't know whether it can ever end. Several people already asked me, can this ever end? And I don't exactly, precisely know what this was referring to, but some kind of a problem we have with ourselves and each other. You don't know, but find out more about it so that the space opens up and there is an increasing transparency. which may leave us quiet and humble. Not humiliated, it's different. Humble. Not so full of ourselves. What we thought was so important. So crucial. Another question 
I came up, several people is, when it gets too wild with these thoughts and emotions, is it all right to come back to the breathing? The first response when a question like this is asked is, who are you asking? And one, one can look at it. It's not a clever sort of, how do you say, when you put something back on somebody. No, let's look. Are we asking somebody else to tell us? Or we would just like to hear what, what do you feel about it? But how is it, how is it working for you, listening to the breathing in the midst of turmoil? When the mind opens up a bit, how can we help not hearing the breathing and the breathing of the wind? It's there. And what is there is worthy of being listened to. Not because it's my practice, but because it's present. And the breathing, of course, is a, a marvelous thing ever close to us. The most vital physical function probably there is. Correct me if I'm wrong. Can't live without air for very long. And since the most ancient of times in spiritual practice, awaring the breathing has been the predominant practice or the beginning practice, the ending practice. Because, as the ancients have told us, thought process is connected with a breathing process. And paying attention to the breathing may interrupt or bring to light the thinking process. I read that long ago in a Tibetan book. And how true it is. So. Can we approach breathing and winding and thinking, emoting, tensing, sweating and freezing? Can we approach it not as a practice, but as something that is here worthy of being beheld? If I just think I, I gotta come back to my breathing and count it or follow it from the tip of my nose to the abdomen so I'm not overwhelmed by thoughts, well, there's a certain tension in that and a doer who either is successful or fails. But this is what we want to expose the doer who succeeds and fails, which is thought. And why not? at least at a glance, see those thoughts that are troubling. Be intimate with what troubles a human being like you and me. Thoughts about the future, thoughts about the past. Always involving me. Can we be ever more intimate with this process without being sucked into it and that is the difficulty. Being sucked into thought and the space is gone and we're chock full of ourselves. And then miraculously as it were to wake up from that again awareing that there has been thinking and emoting and tensing all in the tightest of space. And then not falling for the judgment trip, but sticking with this moment of awareness. Peep. Uh, the, 
the, the mind wants something more at this moment because the, the, the thought trained the involvement and it was very gratifying one way or the other. Even painful thoughts are gratifying because we're doing something. So, a moment of coming to, waking up from having fantasized, day dreamt, night dreamt, and not know what to do. Just listening to breath or whatever is twittering about. And then inevitably for most human beings the question comes up, is that all? Is that what I came here for? To hear, to tw hear twittering birds? It's what one person said very seriously. Not, not flippantly. Please, I need to hear from you whether this is enough simply to listen. Is that enough? It could be so simple if I understood that it can be as simple as that. Again, who are you asking? Because if there is authority in the mind that asks that, asking an authority, and the authority says, yes, that's it. Just listen simply. Then what happens? I've got something to take home. What does it mean, simple listening, without becoming a thing? Without a listener, Just simply hear. Not a conceptual hear. What am I beyond all of these concepts? And then, as people were mentioning group meetings, ah, oh, with this question comes sort of a, a fearful sensation. Beyond concepts, beyond what I know? Wait a minute. I need to stick with what I know. It's not all spelled out like this, but that's what this fearful sensation says. Don't believe it, just, just let it be there. As it manifests, comes and goes in simple beholding. That doesn't want anything. No next moment. Just this. We will end here for today.